Hi, thanks for joining us today. Um, this is the session of the Inequality by the Numbers workshop, where we're going to be talking about inequality in New York City. So I'm gonna try and do a couple of things um, in my half hour. Uh, talk about uh, trends in uh, income inequality in New York City over the past 35 years or so. Uh, and also spend a little bit of time looking at the impact of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, on um, New York City, its communities, and uh, its effect on um, inequality. Okay, James Parrott is my name. I'm the Director of Fiscal and Economic Policies at the Center for New York City Affairs at the New School. I'm gonna to touch on three things today. I'm gonna to look at uh, sources and trends behind income inequality in New York City. Uh, I'll be looking at the past decade, the pre-pandemic, post-Great Recession decade of the 2010s, uh, where we saw rising incomes for the bottom half of the income distribution. And finally, talk about a new strain of inequality with massive pandemic-related job losses in New York City. We start with the uh, classic Emmanuel Saez 1% uh, share of income chart for the United States over the past century uh, or so. Uh, this is based on income tax data, including capital gains. Um, I divided the graph here into to, uh, three sections. The previous peak uh, was reached in uh, 1929, um, and then you can see the 1% share receding uh, through the Great Depression and World War II, uh, followed by around 35 years uh, from 1945 to 1980, roughly, of remarkable stability in the 1% share uh, at around 10% uh, over that period. That stability ended uh, in the 1970s, and the 1% share generally has risen since then, returning to the 1929 peak uh, of 22% or so in uh, 2007. And then it stayed roughly in the 20 to 22% range since then. The middle section of the chart shows this period, uh, 45 to 80 or so, of uh, you know, a semblance of shared prosperity, where uh, broad-based economic growth in the United States the incomes of the 1% uh, certainly rose in real terms over this period, but their share didn't rise relative to the rest of the economy. And this was the, the golden age, so to speak, of the white middle class in uh, the United States with uh, rising incomes and growing numbers of people uh, in, in the middle. Uh, I say it's a semblance of shared prosperity because of course it left out uh, African-Americans and, and most people of color and most women who were not part of married couple uh, families. What changed around 1980? Um, well, you know, it's not the focus of uh, my talk today, but you know, it's not internationalization of the economy, globalization, or technology per se, but policies changed. Uh, class conscious policies um, propagated by the 1% uh, from the national level down, and we'll see the local manifestation of those in New York City to some extent. I think you know, a very accessible uh, treatment of this policy change uh, uh, situation is the book by Jacob Hacker and Paul Pearson, The Winner Take All uh, Politics. The, um, we take the last third of that 1% uh, share uh, chart and uh, uh, look at it here in more detail with New York City data uh, included in that in red, uh, the, the top bar. Um, and you can see that uh, the 1% share is uh, higher throughout this period uh, in New York City, although it started you know, roughly around the same 10 or 12% level as uh, at the US at the beginning of this period. And then it's generally risen in the United States, but has risen uh, more in uh, New York City. Um, the 1% share in the city peaked at about 44% in 2007. Uh, let me see if I can get my the video uh, moved here a little bit so you can see the movement in recent years um, where it's been up and down, up and down in the 35 to 40% uh, range. So it stayed high, but it's interesting that it hasn't kept rising. Um, of course, this data only goes through 2016. 
Uh, we expect that it might have risen in the, in the past couple of years. But it's also possible that, that the, uh, the government tax data is just not reflecting uh, as well, as, as accurately, the annual incomes <clears throat> of people <clears throat> when they're rising into the hundreds of millions uh, of dollars. Uh, of course, there's less, less incentive to report all the income if there's no consequence if you underreport on, on, uh, on your taxes for the most part uh, for very high income people. Um, now, what accounts for New York City's higher uh, income concentration? Uh, you know, some of the usual suspects are a very large finance sector. New York City is the capital of capitalism uh, and the financial cap capital of the United States and beyond, uh, most likely. It's a, it's a large corporate headquarter, quarters, and a lot of professional services, uh, uh, legal services, accounting, management, consulting, <clears throat> um, and, and so on. Uh, a lot of inherited and new wealth in New York City. Um, and, and real estate is a big factor here. And I wanna, I wanna say a little bit more about that because this is, the real estate doesn't, doesn't uh, I don't think it uh, gets equal time with these other factors in discussions of income inequality. And yet it's, it's a very prevalent factor at a local level. Um, uh, private landowners have been able to capture the tremendous appreciation in land values in a place like Manhattan where land values are very high. Um, Often the increase in land values uh, has uh, been intensified or boosted by public actions for rezonings. Um, and there's been a transition over the last uh, you know, 30 to 50 years from, uh, heavy from, from extensive manufacturing uses, like manufacturing uses in New York City to more commercial activities. And you know, that, that goes for Manhattan as well, which used to be the home of um, you know, uh, several hundred thousand garment manufacturing jobs, but also jobs in electronics manufacturing uh, and printing uh, and, and other manufacturing sectors, no longer. Um, and then uh, another factor to consider in terms of uh, what accounts for the, uh, the, the more pronounced income polarization in New York City is restrictive zoning practices, residential zoning practices in the suburbs around New York City, which is concentrated low-income uh, households in New York City, and as well as uh, other cent center cities around the country. Uh, let's look for a moment at the composition of the 1% uh, income in New York City. Um, so when you think of all the, the incomes received by the 1%, uh, wages are the big, biggest portion of that, uh, represented about 36%, um, and about 25% each from capital gains and business income and then dividends and interest were the remaining 12%. And then if you look at the 1% share of different forms of income in New York City, overall they have 36% of all income, 18% um, of uh, wage income, a uh, very high percent of dividends and interest and business income, 70% dividends and interest, 71% of all business income, and 86% of realized capital gains, reflecting the fact that stock ownership and uh, high-valued land, uh, which also generates capital, realized capital gains, are very highly, the ownership of those assets is very highly concentrated uh, in New York City and most places. Um, there's an interesting story to be told. We, we will only have time to just scratch the surface of that uh, today uh, in terms of relating uh, changes in the structure of the city's economy uh, post-1980 to key income metrics and also to think about how those the changes in the structure of the economy were affected by policy choices, mainly at the national level, but to some extent at the local level um, as well. Um, and it would be even more interesting to be able, if we had more time, to look at those income changes in terms of significant racial, ethnic, and immigration changes in New York City since 1980. Uh, we're going to do a very little bit of that today, but again, just scratching uh, the surface uh, on that. Um, 1980 is, is also a significant historical juncture for New York City, since it marks the transition away from the worst of the city's 1975 uh, fiscal crisis, which, which uh, was uh, very much also an economic crisis related to broad changes in the location of economic activity in the United States a response to uh, civil unrest in New York City and other large cities uh, 
around the country in the in the uh, late 1960s, and a very significant outmigration of both corporate headquarters and corporate jobs from New York City to the suburbs and to the south uh, in the uh, early and mid 1970s, and and then a, a pretty steady outmigration of the white middle class from New York City. Um, Kim Phillips Fine is a um, a political science professor at uh, at CUNY, uh, and she's written a very interesting book called Fear City about the politics of the 1970s fiscal crisis uh, in New York City. She details the attack on New York City's liberal order and expansive government, um, and uh, makes a very convincing argument that there was nothing in, inevitable about the austerity response that played out in New York City to the fiscal crisis. It was a result of choices made at the national level and uh, in New York City and in Albany. And in many ways, uh, the politics of the fiscal crisis are the, represent the local manifestation of the Washington offensive that set in place the policy regime enabling income polarization, the story told in, in Hacker and, and Pearson's uh, books. So here's a list of some of the key economic changes that I think were critical in shaping uh, the city's economy in the post-1980 uh, period. Uh, financial deregulation, these of course are not limited to New York City, it played out you know, a, a across the United States, but, but, but had a, dis a pretty substantial impact, if not dis disproportionate in New York City. Uh, financial deregulation and the rise of uh, financialization uh, and the control over the economy of uh, finance and financial institutions, largely headquartered in New York City. Globalization, increased foreign investment, uh, and not regulating trade. A lot of these policy choices are, 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 are uh, you know, represent a decision not to take affirmative action uh, to change these policies, but to allow them to, to unfold in a, in a way that uh, uh, benefited uh, private market uh, actors. Um, letting barriers to unionization remain is, a, is one of those. Um, Policy drift uh, that uh, David Wilde uh, has so expertly documented in his book on fissuring of the workplace, uh, and you know we saw that there were were not significant policy responses at any level of government to to the uh, corporate actions that uh, characterize this fissuring, uh, allowing the minimum wage to falter, and and also fostering economic competition uh, among the states, which has you know, certainly um, had a major impact in New York City and in many parts of the North as well as all over the country um, in terms of uh, corporations basically blackmailing uh, local policymakers uh, over their jobs and where they're gonna be located and, and extracting uh, tax breaks and economic concessions from state and lo local governments as state and local governments competed for the favors of private investment and the location of jobs. Um, again, you know, looking at the, the real estate uh, dimension of this, um, the New York City uh, version of that story uh, illustrates the elevation of a market rationality above all else. Uh, it, it's, it essentially views the cityscape uh, as owned by private interest uh, and uh, landowners uh, arguing for zoning changes to allow the highest and best use uh, that was an argument that effectively doomed uh, manufacturing jobs and industrial activities um, in Manhattan uh, and in uh, you know, many parts of the Bronx and Brooklyn uh, and, and Queens as well, that had long been the backbone of the city's economy and working class. Um, and this change in this, this uh, broad scale change in land use uh, led to the creation of ever greater fortunes by big developers who were able to capture all of the appreciation in land values. The city never really sought to do rezonings uh, uh, in a way that would allow uh, the public sector to uh, benefit from the appreciation in land values, except to the extent that it uh, enriched the property tax base and the city uh, collected property taxes uh, based on rising appreciation. What I want to do now in the next few slides is, is uh, take one metric um, as, as representative of income trends in New York City in recent decades, uh, 
and look at how these changed uh, over time and do a little bit in terms of you know, looking at the racial and ethnic dimension of that and, and, and talking just very briefly about the relationship of these income changes to broader changes uh, in the economy. So, so I use here uh, median family income um, by, uh, uh, by family in New York City, looking at it by race, the race and ethnicity of the head of the household. And we look at the decennial census years, 1980, 90, and so on, uh, ending in 2018. That's the most recent year for which we have uh, census data from the, uh, uh, from the ACS. Um, you see in the, in, the, in the yellow shaded bars here, the, the growth uh, over each of these uh, decade long or almost decade long periods and how that's fluctuated quite a bit. Um, you know, pretty significant 20.5% uh, increase in the 1980. Now, keep in mind that 1980 uh, was the end of a decade, the decade of the 70s, which was a decade of severe economic contraction. So to some extent, those starting income levels might have been, uh, you know, on the low side because of this uh, extended period of, of economic decline. Nonetheless, there was a pretty significant economic expansion uh, you know, partially fueled, fueled by a, um, a, a booming commercial real estate sector and, and unleashed uh, financial sector lending practices and, and, uh, and, and debt creation practices uh, um, that um, created great incomes and, uh, and, and wealth in New York City. Um, and then in, in the 19, I'll say a little bit more in the next slide about the, the uh, 1990s and the 2000s. And then interestingly, in the past decade, since 2010, uh, also a pretty significant uh, growth in uh, inflation adjusted median family incomes of around 20% uh, over that period as well. And we'll talk about the, the racial and ethnic differences as we go along. Um, so here in focusing on the, uh, looking first at the decade in the 1980s, now keep in mind, this was a decade after we saw a significant um, decline in New York City population from the outmigration of uh, a large segment of the white middle class. So when the economy did recover in the 1980s, it created economic openings for people of color in New York City. Um, and so they were able to capture some of the job growth in the corporate sector and New York City, which had the city government, which had downsized uh, about 50,000 jobs in um, the fiscal crisis period uh, as the city's economy uh, improved in the 1980s was able to add back many of those jobs. So African-Americans and, and uh, Latinx uh, people uh, were able to uh, garner many of those openings in the, in the uh, public sector uh, as well. So you see, interestingly, you see stronger income gains for black families in the 1980s than for uh, white families. Although keep in mind that the starting income levels uh, were much lower for families of color than for white families. Um, following uh, the following decades, there were income declines uh, in, in, for all families overall in New York City in the 90s and 2000s. And, um, and, and for the most part, uh, you know, worse declines uh, for black and and uh, Latinx families um, uh, and Asian families, particularly in the in the 1990s. Um, this was a period of significant corporate downsizing of administrative and middle management jobs in the 1990s. Um, then the first decade of this century saw a continued boom on Wall Street that mostly bypassed persons of color uh, and real wages stagnated over both of these decades. Uh, there was not a lot of net job growth from 1989 to 2008, and much of the job growth that did take place was in low-paying service jobs, in retail, tourism-related jobs, home health care, uh, other health care jobs, uh, social services, personal services, and so on, uh, you know, lower and, and, and moderate income paying jobs. Then since 19, since, I'm sorry, since 2010, we've seen very strong net job growth and diversification uh, away from Wall Street, and, and most importantly, uh, a doubling of the minimum wage, which we'll come back to with a chart uh, in, in a little bit. 
that lifted incomes for a lot of people in the bottom half of the income distribution. So that's a quick overview of income trends uh, by families. You're probably wondering how, you know, how did the composition of families by race and ethnicity change over this period? So this slide shows that and, and shows very clearly uh, the declining share of white families in New York City from uh, a little over half in 1980 to about a third uh, in recent years. Uh, a, a fairly stable, um, slightly declining in the recent period, black share at around 21, 22 percent. Uh, 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 Latinx share growing from around 20% in 1980 to 28%, and, and, a, and a, a very sharp rise uh, in the Asian uh, and all other um, category from 3.6% in 1980 to uh, 18% in 2010. Uh, this chart shows uh, median family incomes for families of color relative to whites. Uh, uh, over you know this uh, this period since 1980, and you can see that for Black and Latino families, that has roughly been in the 50 to 60 percent range. 50 to 60 percent of white family uh, the median family incomes, um, and you know, that situation hasn't improved very much over that time. Although in the past decade, some improvement for uh, for Black Black families. Now uh, let's talk more about the um, uh, the last decade, because it's been a different kind of growth, uh, although underlying problems uh, still persist. Um, move my picture here. Uh, so real wage and income growth for the bottom half uh, uh, of the income distribution and for many workers of color. The uh, first time since the 1960s that economic growth in, in New York City has not uh, been heavily dominated by Wall Street. Uh, Wall Street is uh, is still a very significant factor in the city's economy, but 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 hasn't played the the the, uh, the overriding uh, dominant role that it played in the 19 uh, late 1980s and the 90s and 2000s, culminating in the financial crash of uh, of uh, 2007 2008. Um, still, you know, the financial bailout of Wall Street was near complete and. Uh, Wall Street did very well uh, as a result of that, but but uh, other things have been happening in the city's economy so that it's not as exclusively, uh, re, you know, uh, dependent upon Wall Street as it was. There's been some progress in extending labor protections, uh, you know, the, at the state level, at the at the city level, uh, regulation of fast food workers, higher minimum wage for fast food food workers. Um, you know, the, the, the $15 minimum wage was first implemented for fast food workers, then a year later uh, started to be phased in for, for other workers. Um, but still a uh, significant growth in the gig economy and a fraying of the worker safety net. So our the state unemployment uh, and workers' comp systems uh, haven't really seen significant improvements uh, in, in the last decade. Um, the quality of life has improved and, and crime has uh, remained low in most neighborhoods. But housing segregation and school segregation in the early grades continues, uh, and rents and real estate values have risen. Uh, city actions: the city uh, rezoned a lot of uh, land in the 2000s under Bloomberg. Uh, De Blasio has continued that practice um, with a lot of rezonings, but but not done in a way that really preserves affordable housing and, and allows most of the gains of the appreciation and land values to accrue to private real estate owners. Um, uh, you know, before the, the pandemic uh, set in, uh, we had historically low unemployment levels with unemployment around 4% for the last two or three years, uh, historically very low uh, over um, this period of time. The, um, let's move over there. Um, the most significant development, I think, was the substantial increase in the minimum wage in New York State, um, effectively doubled over a period of five years. Uh, in 2013, when the state first acted to start raising its minimum wage above the federal level, New York was still at the 725 federal level. Uh, you can see here how it rose over the years. In 2016, the state acted to fa start phasing in the $15 minimum wage. So. It, it, that first uh, occurred in New York City uh, at the very end of uh, 2018. So 
between 2013 and 2019 uh, a um, more than doubling in the minimum wage. Uh, and that direct, you know, pretty directly affects the wages received by the bottom third of the workforce. And then some portion of workers above that benefit from spillover and wage compression uh, uh, effects. Um, so this has meant significant wage improvements for people at the bottom, which are clearly indicated in, in this chart, which shows decile, uh, income, decile uh, wage changes uh, by deciles of the wage distribution for two periods, 2009 to 13, and then the last uh, five years, which we had data here, 2013 to 18. Uh, so the red bars are the early part of that period, and that shows, you know, that's the more typical picture where where real incomes are stagnating or declining for people in the bottom half of the distribution, some increases in the upper half. Last five years, a different picture, uh, much uh, you know, sustained increases uh, throughout the bottom half of the uh, income uh, of the wage distribution, 15% uh, real increase uh, at the um, 20th percentile wage. Of course, people at the 90th percentile uh, you know, doing even better. Um, that's more the the usual case. Uh, um, but pretty substantial increases here, and you can see that in recent ethnic terms in this slide. Um, and here, uh, to keep it simple, we looked at the second decile, the median, and the eighth decile as an indication of the low wage worker, a typical typical worker in the middle and a typical sort of worker uh, toward the top at the eighth decile. And you can see uh, black workers uh, at all of these three points in the wage distribution uh, doing fairly well in this uh, period. And the, the second decile and the median black worker doing better than their white counterparts and Latinx workers also doing a little better than their white counterparts uh, over this period. So again, uh, the the uh, uh, the growth in uh, wages is has been better for blacks and uh, Latinx, but keep in mind that their wage levels are lower to start with. I don't want to give the impression that this has been um, you know a golden age for the economy overall. There's still very, you know very persistent uh, structural and long-term problems here. Um, uh, and just, you know, three, here are just three indicators of that. Um, but in the interest of time, let me not spend too much time on that. But uh, other than just to note the first one that, for example, if about 23% of New York City residents uh, lived in poverty in 2016, over, uh, you know, uh, any two or three year period, many uh, families uh, uh, enter or leave poverty so that the total number of families that have experienced poverty over a three year period is about twice what the poverty rate otherwise is. Let me turn now in the last few minutes to talk about this new strain of inequality uh, with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. This is from the cover of a report that I released with a colleague at the New School back in mid-April where we projected that by the end of April, New York City would see the loss of 1.2 million jobs. It's about 25% of the total, heavily concentrated uh, among persons of color in industries characterized by largely face-to-face -face interactions, local service-oriented industries in uh, accommodation and uh, restaurants and local retail and so on, a very disproportionate kind of impact, not like a typical recession at all, where you see job losses dispersed across the economy, uh, a very um, a pronounced concentration of job losses in lower paying sectors, uh, lighter lob, uh, job losses so far in higher paying sectors in the finance sector, professional services, uh, information management consulting, and so on. Um, this chart shows uh, the incidence of uh, COVID-19 cases in New York City uh, with the darker colors uh, meaning higher uh, higher uh, density of, of cases. And these tend to be, you see a lot in the Bronx here and a lot in Queens and on the North Shore of Staten Island. These uh, are lower income areas uh, of the city and so on. And, and a lot of the economic hardship has also been concentrated in these same areas as opposed to you know, parts of Manhattan around Central Park. Um, 
So again, the pandemic job losses are very different. Uh, in the report, we look at three categories uh, of jobs, the face-to-face -face jobs and the local services, essential public health, uh, safety and sustenance jobs and healthcare and uh, public safety jobs and the food uh, distribution chain and so on. And then those jobs that we refer to as remote jobs, uh, mainly professional and managerial jobs that can be done remotely where people have um, been inconvenienced, uh, certainly, uh, you know, it's at some at public uh, health risk, but by and large people who have kept their jobs, kept their salaries, kept their benefits and so on, and not experiencing anything like the hardship concentrated at the lower income, uh, low end of the income distribution. 85% of job losses uh, in mostly uh, low wage face-to-face -face industries. Uh, two thirds of job losses, we estimate among persons of color, two thirds among those earning less than $40,000 a year, only 10% of job losses among those earning uh, $100,000 or more. Uh, over half of job losses among immigrants with nearly 200,000 among undocumented workers who are not eligible, by the way, for any form of uh, federal economic assistance or not eligible for unemployment insurance. Um, over a third of, of all young adult, uh, adults between 18 and 24 have lost jobs. So this doesn't bode well for uh, uh, a lot of uh, low and moderate income uh, CUNY students uh, or others who are trying to make their way in a, in a very high cost New York City. Uh, the job market outlook for them is, uh, is uh, on the bleak side, to put it mildly. And of course, with uh, a million or more people losing jobs, a lot of people are gonna be losing health insurance over this period uh, as well. The city began to reopen uh, recently on June the 8th. Um, uh, and we can see so far that many of these jobs are not quickly going to return and unemployment's gonna stay high. Um, my sense is it will stay in the 15% or higher range uh, for many months, possibly through the end of this year. Um, you know, and uh, work and business practices have to accommodate social distancing. So a lot of these jobs in the face-to-face -face service and you know, restaurant and retail industries are not gonna return and these businesses uh, will be operating at much less than 100% of capacity. And many of them has, have such uh, tight margins that they won't be able to survive for very long operating much below 100%. So we expect to see uh, significant business closures as well. Uh, the $600 a week supplemental unemployment insurance benefits are due to expire on July 31st. Um, doesn't seem as though Republicans in Congress are, are inclined to, to extend uh, those benefits. Um, and uh, as I pointed out, uh, uh, undocumented workers are not eligible for most forms of economic assistance from the federal government, and a significant number of them are still without jobs. This is clearly a case where more federal action, uh, economic assistance is needed, uh, and, and I believe the extent of unemployment will be so persistent, you know, by late summer and early fall, that there will be, uh, you know, a, an active public discussion on the need for uh, job creation uh, and, and public works uh, programs at a national level. Um, there are things that can be done at a local level to uh, try and make the situation a little bit better, and, and, but, but mainly changes in labor policies that will uh, serve uh, low-income workers better over the next few years as the economy does eventually uh, recover. In the meantime, we need to minimize budget cuts through progressive and business taxation at the state level. Um, we saw how, how hard pressed many independent contract workers uh, had become when the economy shut down in March. So we need to, New York State should enact an ABC test as California did for, uh, to clarify the employment status of uh, workers uh, long uh, considered to be independent contractors by the businesses that they work for. We need to improve access and benefit levels for state unemployment uh, insurance and workers comp and uh, start to address more in a more serious and thoroughgoing way, health and housing uh, inequities and pay inequities. Um, uh, of course, the, this, uh, this public health situation raises uh, questions about the future of dense cities like New York City. Um, we saw a similar concern, uh, similar in some respects, concern after 9-11 when there was concern about whether or not uh, businesses uh, would want to operate in 
in, in dense cities that might be targets for terrorist attacks and whether or not people would want to live in those cities and so on. And yet, within a few years, we saw that you know, New York City's resilience really play out uh, and, and how New York City expanded uh, you know, fairly quickly um, uh, after two or three years had passed. So um, you know, I expect that the, there will be, uh, we will figure out how to deal with, uh, uh, hopefully we'll learn uh, from uh, the mistakes in dealing with this public health crisis learn how to deal with those more effectively going forward, uh, and the productivity benefits of dense concentrations of economic activity that make, make possible face-to-face -face interactions and the cultural attractions of large cities will, will uh, resurface and, and New York City will be desirable uh, once again and, and attract, it will be desirable for people to stay here and expand. And of course, a lot of people uh, of moderate and, and uh, uh, modest income uh, means um, are not contemplating going anyplace else. So the city should really concentrate on improving the quality of life for the people who are here now. Uh, and uh, one thing we need to avoid doing is providing uh, subsidies for real estate developers, as has been the, the city's response uh, to the 1970s fiscal crisis, our response to in the post 9-11 uh, environment uh, as well. So. There are many things that can be done at a local level to improve the uh, labor market policies and regulation and to improve the control of real estate and uh, the um, uh, availability of uh, affordable housing uh, that can ensure an affordable and livable and, and more equitable uh, city. So let me stop at that point. Thank you. Uh, if you do have questions, uh, I think I have my there's some other publications you might want, might be interested in. My email address is parrotj uh, at newschool.edu. Thank you.